That was quite an introduction, Maruf. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as the underpinnings, the presumptions that underpin our political economy today, what the consequences have in fact been, I think contrary sometimes to the deal with the problems that we're facing today as a society. Um, the jurisdiction of the Securities and Exchange Commission there extends to bribery by subsidiaries or indeed even their agents. Now, <clears throat> possessing coal and capital, unfortunately, is no guarantee that India's energy boiler is going to work properly. I think a dangerous mix of bad policies, weak institutions, corruption, and, an, and weak government oversight implies that there's a way in which the rule of law is of somewhat something of a broken down structure. Um, I think we have particular examples of institutions that do work, that give us something of a illusion that things are working. We have a Supreme Court that steps in from time to time with sometimes, you know, very positive judgments that are welcomed by everyone. Um, but India's ranked 182 in the world in terms of enforceability of contracts. So what then does this mean? It means that this conviction, this widespread conviction that we must have growth at all costs expresses itself in different ways. It means that even though it's been discredited by economists, and I'm sure we have um, some eminent economists within us, among us, this idea of the trickle-down effect, that it leads to development, that it will pull India out of poverty, um, you know, I, I think has a sort of subliminal grasp over the, the um, imaginations of government and of sections of the government, that is. And much of, you know, so the, the fact that we, that in, an investment climate needs to be created, this idea, then leads to influence of, corporate influence, finding sway in other ways. What are the consequences of this? I think, are these goals even being achieved? Do we have a climate that is favorable to investment? As I already mentioned, our contracts are very, very difficult to enforce. Um, arbitrations resulting in challenges in court for a single judge, before a division bench, before the Supreme Court, the whole thing could take 20 years. Um, we have hugely expanded influence of some sections of industry and central and state governments. We've seen this in the allocation of coal blocks. The CAG report shows that although, I mean, and the documentation around it, that although the auction was, uh, the system was approved in 2004, it was only implemented in 2010. So who benefited? Not all of industry, only those sections of industry that were able to influence the government in a particular way to get those allocations. We've also seen that large tracts of land, like I just heard about an example where 3,000 acres were allocated to a, a, a large power project, whereas only 15,000 acres, um, I beg your pardon, 1,500 acres, um, was in fact being used. We've also seen, in fact, that influence of this kind has, in some areas, become so widespread that in Chhattisgarh, for example, any dissent to this is being quelled with the force of the criminal law. So we have a society in which our democracy, that, is, that we so pride ourselves on, um, free speech is being quelled, you know, uh, using the force of sections like sedition. Our eminent panel before this was uh, discussed the two Indias and how inequalities have increased. On the one hand, one sees that it's hard for industry to acquire land for renewable energy projects, for instance, like 
um, harnessing wind energy, etc. And on the other hand, you have a tribal who may not wish to leave the land of his or her forefathers to live on a construction site and live in a jubi. I was on the right to food drafting committee, and um, the economists on that committee um, were advocating quite strongly for the universal right to food. Now, why is this? It's because the idea is that if you have a system where rich people and poor people both participate, the participation of the rich people will in itself strengthen the system, and then everyone will benefit. It's very difficult for poor people to prove through documentation and other means that they are the right kind of poor people. The additional outlay that was required for this was only 20,000 crores. If you look at our scams, you look at the Commonwealth scam, you look at the 2G scam, you look at what we've lost in, the, uh, it's what, in what's now being called Colgate. The amount that was lost was a geometric uh, uh, equivalent of that. Um, but I think the point to recognize, actually, is that what we see as two Indias are not really two Indias. We all live with a sense, with some sense of insecurity. We all need to make a certain amount of money to be safe. A lot of our security has been privatized. We live in gated communities, most of us. We live with private security. To make enough money to have our children, our parents, and our families have adequate health care, to get our children adequate education, means that we need to make quite a lot of money, or need to have quite a lot of influence. And even then, there's a certain sense of security that even us sitting here in our five-star hotels have to face every day. To a much lesser extent, of course, than a person in what we've been calling the other India, um, who doesn't have you know, two square meals a day, who's a contract laborer, and who's suffering from the breakdown of labor laws um, that haven't been revised for many decades now. I think another important consequence of <clears throat> our current political economy is that violence has increased dramatically. So in the 1990s, as we know, only 15 of India's 630 districts experienced Maoist violence. Now 200 districts do. The Manesar incident revealed how polarized some managements are from labor colleagues. On the one hand, there was a manager who was murdered. And I don't think there's any two ways about that. And I think that, that's something that um, exists and can't. And on the other hand, we have contract labor who were getting 6,000 rupees per month while others were getting about three times that for the same job. And these people were getting approximately two seven-minute breaks in which they had to use the bathroom, have a snack, and have their tea, and then get back to work. And getting back late, I think even a couple of minutes, was penalized by um, cutting half a day's wage. So in the way the corporate form is structured is that if one's shareholders are only interested in short-term profits, larger goals that lead to perhaps better business are left to activism. But I think if we recognize, um, if we recognize that it is in all our interest to strengthen the rule of law, and that if we want to live in a society where people do what they say they will, where colleagues, management, and labor are earning at least a living wage, where excellence is rewarded, where small players don't lose out to larger players because the larger players have greater influence or are able to you know, divulge a greater part of their profits for um, uh, illegitimate, in terms of illegitimate um, gains to others then perhaps this would at least begin a conversation as to a cross-societal support for a strengthened rule of law, not leaving activism to activists, and to working towards a society I think that we can all believe in. 
I'm going to just end with three technical things that I think you know have worked and it would be great if we could uh, all actually after Mr. Ray has spoken have a conversation about maybe ideas that others have on what can work. One I think one very important contribution to this kind of society is the Right to Information Act. Um, in a litigation that um, that I'm currently arguing on behalf of an Eritropolis company against a state government that sought to expropriate its airport, we were able to get file notings that showed that some of the documents, in fact, had been forged by the state government, which, of course, the courts took quite a dim view of. And that litigation is still continuing because we have a very slow court system. But um, it means that we have the basis to challenge that. Um, auctions, buying things at their market price. Coal block allocations. Uh, we've already seen um, uh, some of us think that, that in 2010 the rules that were implemented was a good thing. But also in terms of land acquisition, rather than paying you know, dirt throwaway prices to people whose land is being acquired, perhaps this new, the newer initiatives to acquire land where a certain amount of the land is um, acquired at market price and then the rest is acquired uh, under the Land Acquisition Act um, is, uh, is something I think that can be thought of. I also think it's really, really important to fix accountability mechanisms like the legal system. At the moment, given that in any case can go on for anywhere between two years if you're lucky, 20 years if you go through the system and pretty much on average actually, um, means that there's a level of impunity in our society that cannot support the kind of society that we all wish to build together. Thank you. I think one of the basic points of this conversation, what we're going to have is what do we mean by activism? And who is an activist? I think the media, like I'm from the media, I really enjoy their presence because they push us to what we now very fancifully call ground level journalism, which is nothing but going to the ground actually. But somewhere, I think for the last couple of years, a series of some of India's mega projects have all gone into a logjam because of a series of protests. If it's Singur and the Tatas, the SR in Chhattisgarh, POSCO in Orissa, Manesar, Maruti. All these issues have come up and time and again they have given us certain points to ponder that where are we heading and why is these issues coming up. So let me start this conversation by essentially trying to ask you that what kind of activism you actually practice and, and do, you, do you individually pick up cases. Let me take the Dow Chemicals case. Now, on one hand, you are trying to argue that they should do what is justifiably their, their part of point. But I don't find any reason in, if people go to London and say the Dow Chemicals need to get out of London and they can't be the main sponsors because they were somewhere directly or indirectly involved in the Bhopal gas tragedy. So how do you see the two issues and how do you balance it? Sorry, what was the question again? My question is, there has been a series of protests over what DAO's responsibility would be and what you probably feel the government's lackadaisical tactics in handling the DAO issue. But there has been a series of protests from India pushing the London Olympics organizers, asking them to boycott DAO and get DAO out of the list of sponsors because of their indirect or direct involvement in the Bhopal gas tragedy. Now, okay, where I is the connect? Okay, I wouldn't have appropriated this forum to, for a soapbox for my profile cases, but thank you for that, Shantanu. Um, I think essentially, okay, I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you an example. 
When I first took on these cases about five years ago, I googled DAO. And what came up was their main website, which had some women going into a bauli, collecting water, coming out, and uh, this was part of their initiative to provide clean water to some, a few women across India. Now, this was, this corporate, the CSR initiative was happening while 40,000 people were drinking water contaminated by dichlorobenzene, hexachlorocyclohexanes, and other such chemicals which cause cancer, birth defects, and other such diseases. Now, I found this particularly you know, bemusing, actually, because there's this kind of greenwashing, this kind of you know, eyewash that was being created. Um, and particularly, I think, at the time, because, you know, people were like, oh, Bhopal, it's gone on for so long, and I think the media wasn't really doing its job at the time. Um, you know, because I think it's hard. I think the media is pegged to, uh, media output is pegged to um, current events. And, you know, Bhopal's an injustice that's been going on for, what, now? Almost three decades, right? So people get bored of it. But media, media did cover Bhopal, if I'm interject. Very not serious. at the time, not at the time. After about 2010, June okay. 2010, okay. it picked okay. up again. Um, so I think this initiative, I think the sponsorship of the Olympics, right? I mean, I think there's a way in which you can create an image of a company that is really quite contrary to the reality of the company. Um, as I mentioned, I represent a lot of companies. And not that I'm saying that, you know, all the companies I represent are, you know, uh, wonderful, but there are companies that are doing their job, that are doing, their, doing it well, that are employing people in fair ways, and that that's the reality of the situation. When you have a situation where a company like Dow Chemicals, which is you know, merged with Union Carbide, and it's essentially the same company, is continuing, like even today, to not deal with the toxic waste that it dumped and left, you know, many years ago, that's continuing to poison people, their children, their children's children. And that's going on as we speak. I think to then allow that company to sponsor an event like the Olympics, which is supposed anyway, to, you know, showcase the best and the strongest and, you know, the, the, the goodness, a sense of sport, a sense of, you know, I think that's, I think that's a problem. Okay, I mean, but, I mean, where does the problem lie? You also refer to a company which you talked about the Bowery and people going and picking up water. Which one? And you're yeah. talking about a company contaminating water. Are you referring to a cold drink company which actually did that and who do you think they're trying no, to no, cover no. it up? I'm talking, you talking about, about Bhopal. What are you talking about Bhopal? I'm talking but about Bhopal. A lot of people okay. aren't aware of this. But also, let's, let's get into on a much serious issue like the multiple companies that have had their projects stalled. And in the name of activism, uh, multiple groups have propped up in those areas, and all of them are trying to tell the company what they need to do. So where do, how does growth happen? It's a very good story for me or for writers to write that listening to grasshoppers and all of that. But where is the growth? I mean, how does growth happen? The world's largest steel company can't even set up the plant here. We have serious problems in other parts of the country where people trying to acquire land, they have gone into a log jam. So from where do you see yourself in trying to circumvent rules or trying to go and tell the companies? So what kind of a role do you want to adopt? That you go and tell the company that what they need to do and they'll actually follow you? I think there may be some confusion about my role. I don't call myself or see myself as an activist. I'm merely a lawyer. Um, so my interest actually is in the rule of law. So okay. therefore, if we have people, if we have, for instance, a situation like Vedanta, where you go into Orissa and you circumvent PESA, the, you circumvent particular legislations, mm. or you buy over um, local populations, or you, I think, as long as people stick by the rule of law, I feel as long as we all do our jobs, the lawyers do their jobs, the journalists do their jobs, the companies do their jobs, 
and the regulators do their jobs. And as long as we do our own jobs well, okay. I think the system, this is the way the system will uh, work best. Suhail has a, finds a point of view. I mean, he has been fairly active on some of the points you have raised. So, you know, uh, one must congratulate Karuna for her enduring and abiding role as a lawyer, given the fact that she got twin degrees from St. Stephen's and the University of Cambridge. I have no issues with that. My issues are somewhat placed elsewhere. We can't develop this country where we have a problem for every solution. Okay. I don't think it is the preserve of anyone other than the courts of law in this country to determine whether people are right or wrong. For activism of the kind that has ensnared its head, where you can't harness natural resources because eight elephants take a walk on some goddamn hill, I think it is ridiculous. Today you're sitting on the world's second largest uh, reserves of bauxite. You can't mine bauxite. You haven't been able to mine coal. I don't know what's happened with Colgate or what will happen. We don't know. We are slowly building ourselves into, digging ourselves into a hole from which extricating it will be extremely difficult. You talk about policy paralysis as far as the government is concerned, it's a paralysis out of fear. Because you don't want these activist types. You know, I remember Sunita Narayan making a hue and cry about uh, pesticides and colas until on one of the programs I asked her, you know, 87% of India's groundwater is contaminated owing to fertilizer subsidies that have been going on, to which he had no answer. But then this is the fate of activism. The same Sunita Narayan is appointed the chairperson of the Tiger Task Force by the government, and on another television program agrees she's never seen a tiger. That's how brilliant we are in terms of determining who should head these. So here's what I suggest. Let's stop creating demons where they don't exist. Relief and rehabilitation is the right of every Indian whose land is taken away or whose land is being mined. I think we need to find solutions to these problems rather than say, oh, let's not do anything. The tragedy is that today's activists, certain brand of activism, which, by the way, is also funded elsewhere. So the same guys who are objecting, who objected to the cola companies, were funded by European Union, which we found out, after which the government, if you remember, instituted the thing that all these NGOs have to declare their funding pattern. So I think, Shantanu, what needs to emerge not at this forum, but perhaps at some other, is how do we move ahead? Should we put all mining to halt? Do that. When you have to pay more for power, when you have to pay more for energy, it'll pinch not the rich. The rich will continue. It'll pinch the commonest of the common, the poorest of the poor. So my recommendation is, I don't think we need to invent a better mousetrap. We need to figure, can we eradicate the mice itself that are darting in and out and preventing real progress for real India. So it's not about, see, the Bhopal issue, you know, she talks about in Dow Chemicals, I have a different view on that. My view is that Dow Chemicals is entitled to do whatever the hell they want as long as it is not in our country. We have no business to dictate to them. Besides, they bought an asset. Our government did a deal with Union Carbide. Our government should be held responsible. Why Dow Chemicals? But well, let's not go there. Finally, two things. Number one, we must find a solution to harnessing India's natural resources without impinging on the fundamental rights of livelihood, dignity, and welfare of our people. Number two, we must find a way to get courts to act with alacrity. The same Vedanta that she talks about, the Supreme Court issued an order saying you must pay 60 crores in an escrow account every year, which they do for community development. Guess what? Not one penny is being utilized, because that, that goes to the government. So governance, to my mind, is a big issue. It's not the activists or corporations. Corporations will, by nature, tweak and you know, fiddle as they want to. But we must have some processes in place. For God's sake, we're not the only country with natural resources. Developed countries have natural resources. How on earth do they allow mining? Why does Canada not have Greenpeace at its heels? or some one of these kind of uh, organizations. Because they've put governance, they've put penalties, and they've put criminality at the forefront of any such violation. Can I respond to that? Just a small, small interjection from Suhail as well. He's fairly, fairly aggressive on some of the points. One point which I, I want uh, to add. Aggressive? I just made the points. Yeah. I, I think I mean, aggressive is just a state haven't... of mind. And Suhail, don't get it. I mean, what I'm trying to say is. Deprived of my afternoon siesta. <laughs> 
what I'm trying to say is, uh, Suhail has raised two very particular points. What do we do then? Do we stop all activity and we wait till the Supreme Court decides on something and we always keep going back to the court? No. no so no, how do you handle it? Actually, Suhail made a few points that I would like to respond to. I think there are a number of things that we do agree on. The fact that the courts need to act with alacrity, the fact that we need better governance. I think that's something that none of us would really dispute. Um, with regard to Dow Chemicals, you say that what they do in other countries doesn't matter. Only what they do in our country matters. Let me give you three points. Three points here. Not at Suhail necessarily, actually, but um, since this is a public issue that we're all involved in, that we all have some stake in, um, to all of us. Union Carbide has cherry-picked its jurisdictions because it's a multinational company and was when the Bhopal tragedy happened. It asked the federal court judge in New York to be sent to India because the tort jurisdiction here does not allow unlimited punitive damages. When it came to the criminal case, Union Carbide, once the criminal judge in Bhopal, the CJM in Bhopal, issued warrants against them, withdrew their assets, absconded, I have court orders on this, withdrew their assets and ran off to America, leaving nothing here. What happened subsequently? There was a merger in 2001 with Dow Chemicals. That merger, and we have authoritative US laws, uh, uh, experts in US law saying this, that merger meant that Dow Chemicals acquired the assets as well as the liabilities. Um, as a result of these acquisitions, Dow Chemicals is as liable for, for Bhopal as Union Carbide is. And given the structure of the multinational, to say that they are only liable in India, that's a smoke screen. Because you have a multinational that where assets can be withdrawn at a moment's notice from different parts of the world, um, particularly when it becomes particularly you know, inconvenient, you don't want to be restricted to one jurisdiction. I think the issue of Bhopal, though, while it is of great interest to me and perhaps to some of you, is perhaps you know, taking us away from the central aspect of what you know, would be of interest to all of us. In terms of natural resources, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that mining is necessary. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that we need coal. I mean, so much of India's power is dependent on, um, on thermal power. I don't think there's any doubt that we need, uh, that we need coal. Um, I think the thing for all of us to think about you know, I mean, to have a TV style debate with Suhail saying something and me saying something and then us having a bit of a, you know. Well, that's all right. I mean, you can always counter him and, and then you can that. But continue this. I think this a debate. much more productive way perhaps to approach this would be for all of us to think about where we want to strike the balance. How do we preserve the right to life? How do we preserve the integrity of our countrymen in terms of, you know, what their rights are while facilitating the growth that we also need, um, not just as corporations, but also as citizens and individuals. OK. But the point is, we, we are probably are getting too much into Dow. Let's, let's come out of it. Well, and shall we throw it open? OK, fine, Might we can. Nice. I mean, we have so many no, sure, people we can. Here, but right? I mean, let's, nice let's not here. just get only into Dow, because I don't probably know probably whether the entire India is united on this. Bhopal gas tragedy, and probably are they, are they still very concerned about what Dow should do or not do? I think the act of governance, as someone has rightly pointed out, is more on the part of the government in terms of confiscation of assets and pushing the case in a higher international court. Indian companies have often gone abroad, they have messed up things. If you notice, Jindals have got into a serious logjam in Venezuela, all their assets have been confiscated, and they are into a serious trouble. So there are global laws, global rules. What my larger point of question is, so you are saying the only way out is that everybody gets involved into a situation like this and they, they and 
all the entire society as a whole has to participate in that. But is that is that a realistic thing? Do you genuinely believe the nation will get involved into, let's say, a POSCO or or POSCO or probably a Manister? Isn't isn't more of that a government issue or a corporate issue? You know, as I mentioned, Shantanu, I really think that if all of us just did our own jobs, you know, if the if the journalists did the, did their jobs and nothing else. If we as lawyers did our jobs and nothing else, if the regulators did their jobs, if we just did our jobs, you know, then this whole so are you, system, are you, are you, I'm not saying that we should all go out on the street and start protesting and, you know, I just think if we just did our jobs with a sense of integrity and uh, vision. Okay. Let's, a lot throw, of it, let's throw it open. So, Probably you want more questions. From the no public? Questions, just okay. sort of thoughts. Okay. Shantanu, why don't you do your job? Why didn't you do your job all these years? No, I'm, I'm doing my job. No, no you didn't. I think it's true. You were deputy job. editor in India today. My what job. the hell did you do? Put Malika Shravel on the cover? I feel the media doesn't do their job for this. Why didn't you the put a Bowell on the cover? Okay. Shocking. Now, my, my only point is I mean, you know, everybody says that the media should do their job, people should do their job, lawyers should do their job. We are doing our I job. Agree. I agree. I think agree. he's doing his job. Yeah, okay. he is. He's a very good jobber. Somewhere, somewhere. So, so let, let's open this up. Let, let's get questions from people. I mean, let's get questions from this side. If somebody is keen to, there, there. Uh, talking about uh, Karna, I think your presentation and your way of putting things is very powerful. Uh, and it's quite satisfying uh, that one must strike a balance. But we, as you know, we in India are striking a balance is like we'll be talking and discussing a thousand years, what is that balance? Equally, the point on governance. I just want as a point of interest to understand as a lesson, uh, what exactly did our government do on the Bhopal gas situation? Uh, and why is it that there's still so many years on a huge amount of dissatisfaction, A, and B, if you can educate us since you're so deeply uh, in the know, as to what are the laws that have been amended subsequently for multinationals and for companies here, uh, which so that some something similar doesn't happen. That's a really interesting question, sir. Um, first on Bhopal, I think Bhopal has been a comprehensive failure of governance and the judiciary. It's almost a poster child of the failure of the justice system and governance. Um, so when this case came to me about five years ago, I was... I Can was you keep told, your mic a little to the... I can't hear yeah, yeah, sorry yeah, Thank you. I mean, I was told, why are you taking on this case? You know, this hasn't gone anywhere for 20-something years. It's not going to go anywhere. What's the point? Um, I am still of the faith that India, our liberal democracy, our courts, are institutions that can be engaged with. Otherwise, perhaps I would have joined, uh, run off to the uh, forest and joined these Maoists or something. And you know, that faith has been borne out. That faith has been borne out because recently um, we had two important victories. This water that we were talking about, this, uh, that has been contaminated, I just got an order from the court saying, that within three months, all of the people who are drinking this water should be provided clean water by the state. Um, and secondly, we got another big order saying that proper health care should be provided. Um, in terms of the, what happened and why, why proper justice did not come to Bhopal, I think there's a just, you know, it's, it's really interesting because there's a variety of different reasons. I think that if the methyl isocyanate leak had happened either in South Bombay or in South Delhi, the result would have been very different. The fact that these are some of the poorest people in our country meant that they didn't have access to um, the kind of power that the companies had. So we have so many, you know, even then, people were saying foreign investment climate, investment climate, investment climate, we can't arrest Warren Anderson because it'll look bad. Now, I don't think Union Carbide is just any kind, I think it's really unfair to tar all companies with the same brush as Union Carbide. All companies are not the same. There are companies that abide by the rule of law, 
even in this difficult situation where very little can get done, um, you know, in an honest way, to a large extent, to whatever extent possible, we have, you know, so many companies in our country that do abide by the rule of law. Um, but there were ways in which, you know, these companies were allowed to get away with uh, what they did on many different levels. So, for instance, we've just filed documents to show that the settlement that was ultimately reached was proposed by the company itself. We got these documents through RTI two months after the disaster happened without any knowledge of the kind of damage that was created and the categories of damage. Secondly, they proposed two categories of damage, temporary injury and permanent injury. Approximately 90% of the people compensated were compensated under the category of temporary injury. Now, there are studies that we now have, internal union carbide studies, that show that methyl isocyanate never leaves the body. There is no such thing as uh, temporary injury. So, which means that the companies were saved a huge amount of money as a result. So, I think there's a way in which there was, I'm almost certain, I mean, and in fact, the, um, some, some people in the BJP, not that I support, you know, one political party over the other at all, um, and want to, you know, as a matter of politics, want to set up a, a SIT against, the, the Cong uh, against what happened at the time between the state government and the central government. Who benefited? Who got the money? So that's the kind of hard power, that's the hard muscle power. And then there's also, there was the soft power, I think, which is this, this idea of, you know, getting foreign investment at any cost, growth at any cost. If we look at our growth figures, you know, there's a sort of idea of growth that is touted. But if we look at our growth figures, a lot of it came from mining and from real estate. Now, who is mining and real estate necessarily benefiting? I mean, I think it's really important when we look at look at the kind of growth that we perhaps want, which is perhaps transparent, ethical, sustainable growth, um, to look at the breakdown of these figures. You know, where is this money going? Where is this growth happening? Um, who is it benefiting? Who is it not benefiting? Which is not to say that, you know, we're entering into some kind of communist society where we have sort of, you know, dole outs across the board. And it's possible, I mean, of course, the companies would make a lot more money than the average uh, farmer. But to make sure that there's a certain level below which nobody in our society goes. I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, there's a couple of other cases. There's the oleum gas leak case. And there was a, quite a lot of jurisprudence that was developed by the Supreme Court after Bhopal. And there's the polluter pays principle, for instance, and the precautionary principle that has been laid down, which is that the polluter pays principle is what it sounds like, which is that if you pollute, you must pay. Um, and the precautionary principle is that every precaution must be taken, um, do no harm, essentially. Well, I, I think we're really running out of time. Thank you, Karuna, for your wonderful words. I mean, I'll just conclude by saying two points. Uh, activism in, in the real sense, probably there is not, probably there's a time, and actually people will have to realize that it has to be separated from areas where, which is larger a governance issue, where the government can actually come in, intervene, and the pressure has to be put on them, rather putting on companies, or probably both. And also, also to a large extent, I think you rightly mentioned that just because Union Carbide has messed up, that doesn't mean all multinational companies have done wrong here. I think if companies have contaminated groundwater here, the same companies have been forced to create a zero water situation for them, that also needs to be highlighted. And I think that has to be a fair amount of way to conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thanks.